Good evening everyone. Hello. I hope you can all hear me. I sincerely hope you can anyway. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, welcome to our first live webinar of 2021, which still feels a bit weird saying it, even though we've been in 2021 for 21 days. It feels very weird still. Um, so, uh, my name's Holly. Welcome to Clinical Psychology Community UK. If you're not already a subscriber, please do subscribe and you'll get all of the updates. I've got some quite exciting plans for 2021, um, which includes a video a week on loads of different stuff related to psychology. Um, I'm going to be doing quite a few reflective models. I'm going to be doing some introductions to psychotherapeutic models, things like ACT and compassion focused therapy, psychodynamic, lots of different things are going to go on um, but to get all of the updates be the first to get all the updates make sure you click subscribe and click on the bell so as I said my name's Holly I am currently working as an assistant psychologist within the NHS um, and today we're going to be talking about the Kolb 1984 reflective model um, it's the latest in our webinar series looking at reflective models and reflective practice and it's hopefully aimed at um, aspiring clinical psychologists like me who want to try and get onto the clinical doctor at one day is the plan. And again, you can follow us on all of the social media down below. Let's get started then. So um, today we are going to be introducing what reflective models are as part of reflective practice. I'll do a very brief introduction on that. I'm going to outline the model, um, the one model that we're working on this evening, and I'm going to give you two different examples. Um, one is more clinically focused and the other one is, uh, it's still clinical, but it's a little bit more situational. And then we're also going to critique the model and think about what the positives are and the negatives are, help you um, learn a bit more critiquing skills. And then we're going to do a QA. and a um, If at any point you've got any questions, do pop them in the chat and I'll try and answer them as, as we're going along or I'll, I will um, wait till the question and answer section. All right. Right. Let's get going then. So reflective models. We often hear what this is. We often hear this when we're working in psychology. Oh, make sure you use a reflective model. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. A reflective model is essentially um, it's uh, a model that provides a framework for reflective practice. All right. It contains lots of prompts and questions to guide your reflections. OK. And it has origins in different disciplines. So lots of them do come from psychology. Um, some come from occupational settings, some come from educational settings, um, but they can be helpful in lots of different ways um, in making you think differently about your experiences. And it's important to take some time to, to do that. And that's why reflective models can be can be really helpful. And obviously, use as part of a reflective portfolio. If you've ever watched any of my videos before, you know that all I care about is reflective portfolios. Make sure that you're keeping like a journal or some place to keep all of your reflections and everything that is going on for you, because that has changed the way that I think about everything personally, professionally. So definitely do that. If you want to know a little bit more about reflective models or reflective portfolios, I do have full hour long webinars um, on the channel. So have a little look uh, on there. The one about reflective portfolios also has some tips about uh, doctorate applications. So check that one out. Um, I will make sure I link them below if you're watching it afterwards. So that's briefly reflective models. Now let's start thinking about the Kolb model, the one that we actually want to learn about today. The reason that you've all logged on. Right. The Kolb model. Essentially, it's a cycle. OK, you might often hear it referred to as the Kolb reflective cycle. And this is what it is. So we start up at the top um, with concrete experience. All right. So that's doing or having the experience. What actually happened in that experience? Can you think about all the different things that happened um, in, in that situation? And then we come to reflective observation, which is reviewing or reflecting on the experience and um, thinking about p potentially what went right, what went wrong, which bits seemed important to you. Um, just essentially reflecting on it, thinking, thinking about it again in it, it afterwards, usually. Then we've got abstract conceptualization, which sounds super, super fancy and super confusing. But actually, all you need to know is that that is concluding or learning from the experience. All right. That's all that is. It's just making plans and working out which bits of your reflections you can take forward um, and uh, which bits uh, you might want to continue to think about, which bits that you might want to spend a bit more time on. 
And then the fourth stage is active experimentation. Again, it sounds super fancy, but all we mean here is planning and trying out what you've learned. So everything you've learned from this reflection, what can you bring forward? What are you going to actively do next time you're in a similar situation? Um, that's essentially what you're doing there. And active experimentation as well. Part of that concept is what works and what doesn't work and spending a bit of time thinking about that. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes a bit of sense. Um, I will make a template available on the Facebook group, um, which I will again link below if you're watching afterwards. You can join absolutely for free. It's not a problem. And I will put a template on there that you can hopefully use um, use in your reflective portfolios. Um, so one of the things I did when I started my reflective portfolio was um, made all of these models, the different models into templates that I would then be able to use to write, to, you know, to draw, whatever, however I wanted to do the reflection. So I will make that template available on the Facebook group. Um, so click the link below or um, or uh, I'll, show, I'll direct you to it at the end. OK. As you can see, it's quite an open model. You know, there's not a lot of prompts. If you've watched any of my other videos, we've we've done some models like the John's 2006 model that has quite a lot of prompts in it. This is a very open one. So, in, you know, when we come to the critique, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it also what I mean by it being open um, is that you can kind of take your reflection anywhere and you can integrate different reflective models and reflective exercises. So part of uh, when I use really open models like this, I also think about the social graces, um, family scripts, uh, different other reflective models like the Gibbs one, I often think about what went well, what went badly, or the prompt, what seemed important for me. So I'm kind of integrating lots of different models. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say social graces, again, I have done a video on this, um, which I'll link below, um, but it's on the page. So have a little look. But essentially, the social graces are things, um, are intersectionality. So how me being a young white, well, youngish, white female, how do they impact my practice? personally and professionally how does it impact me um, and that's a really useful thing to consider in reflections particularly clinically um, because you it's important that us as aspiring psychologists and, and qualified psychologists consider the power imbalances that are there when we're working with clients um, and that might be racially I mean there's an, inher an inherent power imbalance when we're working with clients because we are the professional um, and it's always the, the idea is that we're the expert and that they are coming to us for help. Therefore, they are vulnerable. There's there's you know, so that sort of stuff is super important to consider. And this model is kind of amenable to that. It allows you to do that because it's very open. Hopefully you will get what I mean when I go on to some of the examples. Now, the first example I've chosen is a clinical case and I've changed a couple of the factors the the inf couple of bits of information because just to maintain confidentiality really so firstly um the concrete experience let me talk you through that so um i was uh calling to invite a client to a pilot course and um, that we were running um, they've been on a waiting list for a long time and I, part of my job was to um, assess them and um, assess their suitability for the course, um, which was building low self-esteem um, in older adults. Upon discussion, we found out that actually the client mentioned that they had a lot of clutter around the house um, and that was they were finding that very difficult to, to manage. Um, so I was curious about this. I asked a little bit more. Um, it turned out that actually she had no surfaces in her house that she could lay something down on, you know, no spare surfaces. It was piled up with clutter was the word that, that they chose. Um, it was clear that, you know, the pilot course that I was going to run was not going to be appropriate um, in building low self-esteem for someone that's struggling with um, self-care and potential hoarding tendencies. So it just was not going to be appropriate. Um, so that made me curious what would be appropriate. Um, and, and what I did is I wrote that up and I asked for some support from some more senior colleagues. Um, because we're, we were in a primary care service, things like hoarding um, are not to be treated in primary care. They're not to be managed in primary care because they're too complex and, and quite often very severe. Um, so I knew that I knew that based on my knowledge of the evidence based guidelines. So I made sure that that was the direction I was going towards. 
and luckily my seniors agreed they gave me a couple of measures to do psychometric measures assessments uh, one one of which is the hoarding rating scale for example they indicated that actually she had uh, hoarding in the severely clinical range um, and that she was quite a lot of risk to herself being an older older lady um, and being at risk of falling over and things like that and um, so there was a physical risk as well as a, a you know an ongoing chronic mental health risk going on um so a referral was made and she was accepted into secondary care services which is not always easy um so fortunately that was that was done that is the broad very brief introduction to that experience that was what the experience was um so my reflective observation um i broke when i did this i kind of I just did it how I normally would, but then I realised actually that there is, it's split up into these three sections, which is my personal experience, service provision and evidence-based guidelines. So, got to have a bit of tea in your life. Um, so, my personal experience, um, I have a close family member who uh, struggles with hoarding and I, it, it was almost instant in the conversation when I mentioned, oh, have you, you know, do you know anything about hoarding? Um, has what does the word hoarding mean to you? That sort of thing. I immediately knew that I was hyper aware of hoarding tendencies. When she said clutter, an alarm bell went off in my head um, about hoarding. And I knew I knew straight away that that was because of my personal experience. You know, had I not had that personal experience, I probably would have, you know, not picked up on that quite so sharply as I did. Um, and this, you know, the clutter has been mentioned in her notes um, historically, but it never sort of picked up on um because I, I think it's always meant in passing whereas I because I have that personal experience and deep sort of knowledge of hoarding um I very quickly reacted to it um which I think that is the only reason I'd love to say it's because I'm a great clinician but I really do think it's because of my own personal experience in that one um yeah, it made me alert to to the hoarding. It made me more curious about it. It kind of made me uh, able to challenge the client. It made me able to understand which what language to use um, because hoarders can quite often get very defensive very quickly if it's anything to do with their with their hoard with their clutter. Um, so I knew to to approach that fairly gently um, because it can be very stressful. Um, so, yes, I'm I, I'm really glad that I had that personal experience. Um, but then alongside that, there kind of comes an emotional side to that as well that you need to consider. Actually, my own personal experience, you know, is being mirrored with this client. How does that make me feel? And checking in with yourself. Fortunately, um, I felt fine. <laughs> I was, you know, I actually was really the way I looked at it is that I was really pleased to be able to use that personal experience um, rather than it become overwhelming. Um, and a bit nerve-wracking. Moving on to service provision then, this is another part of my reflection that, that came in. My, As I said, my knowledge of the service provision and evidence-based guidelines, because of a piece of work I had previously done comparing all of the different guidelines, I knew that the hoarding needed to not, not be... Um, uh, needed to not be managed in primary care, so I knew that it had to be referred on, on to secondary care. Um, and that, that again goes with the evidence-based guidelines. Um, and I think that part of me, that picked up in my reflection because we all know that to be a good psychologist, theoretically, you need to um, adhere, you know, abide by the, all these guidelines and following the evidence base is seen as a, a good thing to do. So I think maybe that's why that ended up in my reflection, because I kind of want to pat myself on the back for a bit of work that I am really proud of because she is now getting the help and support that she wanted and needed as well. So that's some of the reflection that, that came up and um, the reflective observation. Um, as well, I mean, yeah, that, that's some of the reflective observation basically that came up. Moving on to the um, abstract conceptualization or, you know, learning, concluding from the experience, in other words. Again, these are sort of three themes that came up for me. Um, recognising issues and competence. Um, you know, we're quite often told that, uh, you know, within the, for example, the BPS guidelines for psychologists, we need to be able to recognise our the edge of our competence and um, seek support when required, particularly as assistants and pre-qualified psychologists. That's definitely a, a key part. 
Um, and I realised actually I did do that and I've not always found that very easy. Um, I've sometimes found it quite difficult to ask for help because I, I'm so keen to show that I know what I'm talking about um, and and make sure that no one finds out that I'm that I don't know what I'm talking about and that I'm an imposter. So actually, it, it meant that I was I was comfortable enough to be able to ask for help, which is hard. Yeah, as the, the second one there is is asking for support. It's really really hard. Um, and and I do have the last one on that box is is relief and thinking about my own anxiety. I'm naturally quite an anxious person. Um, it's sort of it's for a long time it's been my default setting to sort of go to that. Um, and because I knew that um, she really needed to be seen in secondary care, I knew that there was quite a lot of pressure on that referral and making sure that that referral was good and, you know, referenced all the things that it needed to reference to get her an assessment with secondary care. Fortunately, it did. And she's now engaging in treatment, as far as I'm aware, um, for that. So that's really, really good. Now, the last little bit, active experimentation. So... When I say this, listening to everything clients say, I'm always a little bit like this anyway. I'll just take down all of the information and then I'll make sense of it afterwards, which is fine. But what I mean here is that the way she said clutter was a very throwaway comment. Um, and she might have made other throwaway comments um, to do with some related to something else, but I wouldn't have picked that up necessarily. Um, so it's important to really think about and listen to everything that they're saying to try and see if there's a, a door that they're opening almost or you know that you can kind of wedge your foot in and ask a little question about and get a little bit more um because otherwise had had that not happened she probably um would have been invited to the to the course it would not have been appropriate she probably would have dropped out and it would have got a lot worse um so it's really important to listen to everything clients are saying i know that sounds obvious i know um, and to continue to ask for support and guidance because that was a really positive experience for me and asking for support um, where it hasn't always been a positive experience, but, you know, not in this role. But, um, yeah, continuing to ask for support and guidance is, is a very important part of that. And that's something that I still do now. Um, and I'm finding it easier and easier as it goes along. And I I think it's a very useful thing to do. So that's and that's that's kind of my learning from it. Um, you know, as well, I will continue to be curious because that's definitely something we need to we all need to be doing as much as we can. Um, it you know, it gives me assessment skills, formulation skills, um, referral skills, MDT working, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so my plan is to continue doing what I did because I was really proud of that piece of work um, and it's OK to be proud of it. Um, so that's how I used that model um, to to think about that example. And I hope that kind of makes a bit of sense to people um, when you're going through it. But I will go through one more example um, before we get to the critique and the Q&A. Um, let me know again. Let me know if you do have any questions at all um, and, and I'll get to them. So second one then. I, it, it's still a clinical example. It happened in a clinical setting, but it's not quite the same sort of thing. Uh, this one was uh, in my previous role and I was a team leader in a substance misuse service. I was uh, responding to a panic alarm and unfortunately I was the most senior member of staff uh, in the office that day. Um, so when I got to reception, um, <sighs> the client was holding up a computer screen that he'd ripped from reception and was holding it up in the air about to throw it at, at the reception worker. Um, and was screaming. We had other clients in the waiting room. Um, it was it was not good. We had staff st stood around watching the scene because they knew that the panic alarm was going off, which was loud. Um, it 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 was a difficult scene to go into, and you have to just assess it on the spot. That's that's some of the pressure that comes with that. Um, so. What I did in that situation, we cleared the area. We got all of the other clients out. We asked them to wait outside. Um, or, or, and actually, I think in that, in that one, sorry, we had so many of these. So I've just got to pick the right one. Um, in this one, we asked them to go up, up to a different part of the building, up, up to a different floor um, to, to continue waiting for their appointments. Um, 
then we tried to calm the client down we asked him to put the computer screen down which he did i think as soon as a, a lot of the time in that situation as soon as a manager attended um it was immediately like okay now i'm going to be listened to which is not always the case um the staff members were doing an adequate job they were just doing their jobs they were doing really well um anyway so yes he did he put the computer screen down and um I, I asked him to sit down for two minutes um and calm down because I was not going to engage with him um if uh if if he was still up here um because you just can't so uh eventually I, I asked him to leave the building and I said you need to come back tomorrow when you are calmer because I simply can't have you in in the building at this time it took some time it took a long time for him to agree to leave and, and it's difficult in that situation because you're trying not to escalate it again because it, it people can easily go from zero to 100 like that and you wouldn't even notice. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to blink and they would be at a 100 throwing things at you. So, um, so yeah, it took a long time, but eventually he did leave um, and we did a staff debrief um, with the staff members that were involved and we made sure that the clients, the other clients that witnessed that were, were okay. Um so some of my reflective observations um firstly this is this was not as positive an experience um for me as the previous example was uh i reflected on that my priority was to keep all people safe and de-escalate that threat um and to to clearly communicate with everybody involved uh that was you know that's the priority is to keep everyone safe as safe as possible um and that's fine but it's it's very hard um, part of my reflection also is it is really hard to walk into a, a situation like that and assess it instantly and know what to do. Because by the time you get there as a manager responding to a panic alarm, they've been dealing with the situation for God knows how long. You know, it, it might have gone on for 20 minutes before they pressed the panic alarm. You don't know. So you're walking into this and all of the staff, everybody is looking to you going, please, like, sort this out. And that's a lot of pressure. That is a lot of pressure to have on. Um, and I remember feeling that pressure distinctly. And because of that, and because of, I think, my lack of reflective skills at the time, I was really unable to uh, manage that well. I internalised every part of that. I was like, I didn't do well enough. Um, it, that's why he. it took him ages to get out. But essentially, I met the priority, you know, the priority was to keep everyone safe and de-escalate the threat. And that is what happened. Um, but I just keep thinking, oh, I could have done this differently. I could have done this differently. And that's not always a, a helpful way to do it. Um, I mean, the client ended up being banned from the service because they, you know, they threatened to assault a member of staff. You just can't do that. Um, it took some time to <laughs> to get them banned, though. But anyway. Mm. So those are my reflections on that. As you can see, that kind of the way I reflected on it then is kind of messier than the example I gave you before. And I think that just reflects how difficult I found this this situation to think about, which I still do, even though it happened like two years ago. I still struggle to to process it and manage it and deal with it. Um, and that's why the reflections are a little bit messier. But the reason I kept this one in in this presentation is because. I think it's really good to to model that and to to show you that actually your reflections aren't always going to be neat and in a bow and you know in this nice little template this format it's not always going to be like that you know when I do this I annotate all around the sides I you know think about things differently this is just a really simplified version of it um moving on to the third stage abstract conceptualization or concluding or learning from the experience what we did is we ran a staff debrief, um, which was fine. All the staff um, seemed um, reported that they felt supported anyway. Um, but I didn't allow myself to debrief or reflect. That's actually what I learned from that situation is that it was another straw on the camel's back. And eventually that is going to break. Um, you know, it didn't allow I didn't allow myself to really think about it, because I think if I had allowed myself to think about it, I probably would have quit that job a lot sooner because it's it was continued chronic pressure. It was hard. Um, and I, I do think that's what led to burnout. So what I've learned from that is that I need to be able to manage my well-being. 
and I'm sure that you all as aspiring clinical psychologists have been told this countless times, manage your well-being. You don't always have to say yes to everything. You don't have to be so enthusiastic. I've learned the hard way um, of being completely burnt out. Uh, it's tr trust me, trust me. Literally just look after your well-being. <laughs> just do it, please. Find things that you like to do because otherwise you will probably end up with burnout or compassion fatigue at some point in your career and mental health. Um, I think that's the nature of it. So make sure that you are, you know, meeting your responsibility towards yourself. And active experimentation. So um, I now allow myself to debrief after stressful situations. Um, I mean, I'm no longer in that role where every day, every day I would be sworn at every single day of my job there. I think there were maybe two days when I worked from home where I wasn't, but every single day I was sworn at. Um, and it's not that much of a high pressure environment. Interestingly though, the other day uh, I was ringing through to someone and I managed to speak to their wife, but we didn't have consent. So I said, oh, I'm sorry, it's a confidential call. And uh, she swore at me and hung up. And it had quite an effect on me. I wasn't really expecting it. Considering I used to be sworn at every day for like two and a half years, I was super surprised <laughs> that I felt the way I did. But anyway, what I did in that situation, you know, applying the learning from this situation is I allowed myself to really debrief. Um, I told my partner about it. We sort of laughed. I was like, oh, I just, I feel really weird. I feel shocked and I can't really concentrate. So we went for a walk and spoke about it and reflected on it and that really helped and now it's something I can sort of laugh at so um that's that's definitely something that's helped and I use that I allow myself to debrief from everything now I give myself that time because it's essential that you do that um and without that not only for your well-being but I think in terms of reflection I think you get much richer reflection if you really give yourself ample time to to do the reflection and to you know adequate time in between the situation and the reflection um yeah using reflective models I mean as I said I wasn't using reflective models when I was in this role so I'm doing this all retrospectively but if I compare that to my current use of reflective models where I use it on situations that I'm in at the moment I get more out of the this this reflection, the current one, because I'm currently doing it um, rather than the re retrospective. So I continue to use reflective models and I find it really helpful. Um, and yeah, keeping everyone safe is always the priority. So I try and keep that in mind as well. So you've got to kind of do what you can do um, that's ethical <laughs> um, and, and um, you know, within guidelines to keep everyone safe. Yeah. I hope that kind of makes sense. I've given you two very different examples. Um, and as you can see, you know, the, as I said, the first example is quite, quite clean cut and it kind of made sense probably a little bit more. And the second one's a bit messier because it feels messier for me. So I, that's, you know, naturally follows that my reflection would be would be a little bit that way. OK, um, we're going to move on to the critique. Um, but before we do, has anyone got any questions? You know, we're, we're going to. I'm going to come to the question and answer section after the critique. So if you pop some questions in, if you've got any, um, then that will give me some time to think about them what, before the Q&A section. Um, now, you may have your own critique of the of the cold model. You might have your own experience of, of the cold model. But this is something, this is my personal critique on it. This is how I feel about it. Um, some of the positives. It's open. You can choose which aspects to reflect on. Um, and I really like that because, like I said at the start, you can include other models in that. You can include the social graces, the family scripts, um, the, the John's model, the Gibbs model. You can incorporate lots of different bits. Um, and if you don't feel ready to reflect on a certain aspect of the experience, you don't have to. You know, you can choose which bits to reflect on. So that's I think that's a really real positive. It can be applied to various experiences, you know. I gave you two very different experiences there, but it could be applied to anything, really. Um, it could be, yeah, I can't think of anything it couldn't be applied to. Um, it, you know, you don't always have to do it formally either. It could just be informally in your head thinking about it. It can be easily repeated. And what I mean by that is easily revisited. So at either of these reflections I've done, 
I might come back to in six months time and I might do the reflection again and see what's different if there is anything that's different um but they can easily be repeated because it's not a super long model it's brief and quick um or can be anyway depending on, on which bits you reflect on it's cyclical in nature so uh this uh means that well it's a cycle um and if you're like me uh, i quite like there to be like a beginning and an end and it cycles round because that makes sense in my head you know you have an experience you think about it you learn from it you apply the learning and you do it again and you go around you know that kind of makes sense in my head um and it's logical so that's one of the reasons that i think that is a, is a positive thing it is cyclical in nature and it includes a plan. Anyone who's watched any of my videos before knows that I love a plan. Um, yeah, it's got a planning section. In, um, and I think that's really helpful for when you want to apply, apply your reflections. And I think that's how you develop your practice is, is by reflecting on what you've done before and then applying it again. Yeah. Thinking a little bit about the negatives, um, some of the limitations, if you like. Um, is it too open? That's one of the things. Yes, it's very open, but is it too open? Um, and, and kind of what goes into that is, is it, is it difficult for beginners? Um, and that's not to belittle anyone's experience at all. I think if I was new to reflective models and I chose this, I don't think I would do it as well as I would do it now. And that is because it's quite open. Um, I would not know which bits to reflect on necessarily as easily, you know, so that's just that's just something it, it might not be it might be something that really works for you and the way that you think about things it might be really good so this is this, this sort of critiques like a little bit personal to me i suppose um the other thing is that it doesn't prompt you to consider wider psychological theory whereas some of the models do um this one doesn't so that's kind of what i mean um you know, if you're an experienced, if you're experienced in reflective practice, you probably know to try and link it to wider theory. But if you're, you know, early on in your career or new to reflection, actually, you might find that difficult. You might not know to try and link it to psychological theory. So that you might be missing out on a whole, you know, whole area there in your reflection because it's not prompted. Um, but that's just... That's just a few ideas of critiques. Um, let me know what you think, if you've got anything else to add um, or, or what you think about the model. I mean, I suppose another sort of thing to consider in the critique is, you know, it's from 1984. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at literature, to cite literature um, in like a lit review or something, really, we're looking at the last 10 years of research. Um, anything before that is considered fairly outdated changes. You know, it's it's abstract conceptualization. That's like a thing that is timeless. Um, so yeah, okay. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. And we're going to come to the Q and A section. I haven't had any questions in yet, um, but hopefully, um, hopefully someone's going to send a question in. If you've got anything that you want to know about um, the cold model, otherwise I'll just drink my tea. You can watch me drink my tea for a little bit with my little rabbit mug. But it doesn't have to just be about Kolb. You can ask me anything, um, anything about reflective models, um, about my experience. You can ask me anything, um, as long as it's not too personal, because we're on the internet. <laughs> um, mm. While you're um, thinking of questions, we can always come back to questions. I'll move on to the summary, but I can definitely come back to questions if we've got any. Um, basically, reflective models can help you think about things in different ways. It can help you, you know, think about your experiences from alternative perspectives um, and help you learn. The Cobb model is a key reflective model. Um, I think it can be really useful um, and you can find different situations for you that it will work bet better in. Um, as I said, for me, experiences that I think of as fairly positive, um, this is quite nice because it makes sense and it's logical and it's small. But for some experiences that are a little bit messier in my head, um, you might want to choose something with more prompts, like the John's model, for example. Again, I've done a video on that too. I'll link down below. Um, and the last bit is to re use reflective models as part of a reflective portfolio to reflect on a range of experiences. So many uses of reflective, reflect, reflective in that. Okay, essentially keep a reflective portfolio and use these models because they are helpful. I really mean that.
they've massively changed my practice um, in the last year since I've been been an assistant. So, yeah, definitely use them. And coming up to our next webinars. So I'm still going to do a live webinar every month. Um, let me know what sorts of things you want to see on a live. Um, and I'll try and make sure I incorporate them. But as well, I will be doing a recorded video every week as well on a Monday. So um, the next one is on the 25th of February, which just seems like I don't know where time is going. But anyway, Thursday, the 25th of February, and it will be at six o'clock and it will be via YouTube again. And we will be looking at a, a different reflect. This is a very different reflective model. We're going to be looking at the Rolf model. Lots of prompts, really useful. Um, so make sure you tune in for that one. And we're also going to be doing one on the 25th of March. And that is going to be, oh, it's a big topic. It's a big, scary, scary topic. Um, it's going to be via YouTube live stream again. And it's going to be reflecting in a Declan Sight interview. If you don't know what Declan Sight is, do not worry yourself. Um, it's the clinical psychology doctorate program. Usually we find out in the first couple of weeks of March if we've got any interviews and they start interviewing from mid to late March until about May. So we're going to be doing reflecting in a Declan site interview. Um, yes, which hopefully will help. Uh, fab, I've got a question come in. Um, hi there, thank you so much for writing in. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience and where you've previously worked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to be, uh, okay, so I um, did my undergraduate in psychology. Um, I graduated in 2015, which is six years ago nearly. Um, let's not tell anyone though. Uh, then I went and did a master's for a year up in um, Newcastle. Uh, so I graduated that in 2016 and started working um, for the NHS as a support worker in a weight management service, which is sort of helping people lose weight. So that was really helpful for, you know, an introduction to clinical and health psychology. That was really, really useful, which is what my master's was in. Um, yeah, so then uh, I was there for a year. And then I took a job uh, working in a substance misuse service as like a caseworker. It was a recovery worker was the title, but it was a, a caseworker. That was non-NHS. Um, that was non-NHS. Uh, so um, then uh, that was kind of like managing a caseload, mainly of people with opiate dependency and um, alcohol dependency, mainly. Um, and I was there for eight months and then I became a team leader in substance misuse. Um, and that was far more about managing challenging behaviour, managing staff, providing supervision, that sort of thing. And I did. Yeah, I did that for 18 months. Um, and that was that was by far the hardest job. It was really, really hard. Um, but it did give me lots of good experience and, and skills and doing in doing lots of things. Um, then I'm in my current role um, as an assistant psychologist in the NHS, which is a primary care mental health support service. So half of my role is um, sort of general primary care. It's more focused on research and development, really, than um, than sort of clinical work. Um, and half of my role is improving access to primary care for older adults. So I sort of sit half in an older person's specialty and half in sort of general primary care. Um, so as part of my role at the moment um, in research and development, we've um, adapted a couple of courses for older adults. Um, I've done a large-ish clinical audit um, looking at the service, like a service evaluation, essentially. Um, and uh, we've done a couple of other pilot courses, pilot workshops as well. Um, so that's kind of my experience. Um, but I have applied to the doctor six times. <laughs> it's a lot of times. Um, the first two times were practice. I didn't really have enough experience. But yeah, we've applied a lot. We don't really want to write a seventh application. <laughs> um, but hopefully that gives you gives you a little um, little example there. Okay, great. I've had another question in. Hiya. Um, what psychological theories would you consider in relation to your first example? So let me go back to the first example. It was our um, hoarding lady. So, um, so some psychological theories you can you can consider. I suppose uh, CBT is the evidence based um, treatment. I suppose for hoarding. Um, so you can consider a CBT perspective. Um, 
starting with as the, I mean as part of this I did um like a mini formulation with the client over the phone and part of this was looking at the situation and the way that situation was for her is being in that situation with all of the clutter around her so then we went through um her thoughts uh so her thoughts quite often actually were, I am useless. I can't even keep my house tidy. Um, because as well, some core beliefs that she had were quite um, stereotyped gender roles because she was an older lady and they, you know, they had those firmer gender roles that they stuck to. And, and her belief was that a, a woman should keep the house clean. Um, and she felt that she was failing in that in some way. So that was some of her thought pattern there. And then emotionally, um, she felt a huge amount of shame um and uh and a huge sense of um yeah shame and embarrassment she was really really embarrassed about about everything that was going on and i think that's partly why she found it so difficult to sh to share it um she was very lonely as well um very low in mood uh and very regretful and quite angry about a lot of things um, she had had some trauma in her life as well, which I'll come to to talk about a little bit. Um, and then thinking about her her physical sensation. So actually she found when she allowed those thoughts to come in about the clutter, she actually felt very anxious. Her anxiety response was started. Um, uh, so, you know, she would get really like she, for her, she would get really sweaty. She, her heart rate would increase and she would almost be on the verge of a panic attack. She would report, you know, that she felt like she was going to die. She felt like she was going to have a heart attack um, or, or about to have a heart attack. So it wasn't quite full panic attack with what she was describing. But but that's some of the, the physical stuff that came alongside that. And then thinking about the behavior what she would do is try and distract herself completely from it. So if she faced herself towards her TV, she can kind of have blinkers on and not focus on any of that stuff. Um, so she was, she was, her safety behavior was avoidance to make herself feel, feel, feel a bit better. Um, so that's kind of the way the CBT model kind of, um, you can bring that in. Um, and, and then when I do bring in a psychological theory, I kind of, I like inherently critique it when I'm reflecting so I inherently think about well, what do I think about CBT um how do I feel does that does that actually adequately explain what's going on um and for me I'm not sure CBT does because um it doesn't fully consider the history of everything that's going on so a model that I quite like is compassion focused therapy and for anyone who doesn't know, I'd absolutely encourage you and I'd encourage you to get that as well, if you ever can, because it is absolutely fantastic. Um, my I'm doing my next video next week is actually going to be on compassion focused therapy on uh, I'll release that on Monday. Um, so compassion focused therapy, the idea is that you have three different brain systems. So you have the threat system, which is um, essentially to do with survival. So our threat, it's you know to do with the anxiety, the fight flight response. Um, it's about keeping us safe. So if your threat system is activated, you probably sense some threat around you. You feel anxious. You might feel angry. You might feel frustrated. Um, but it's all about making sure that you're that you're safe, essentially. Um, then when you have your drive system, which is kind of like all about incentives that aren't related to safety. Um, so, for example, uh, for lots of us getting onto the doctor. <laughs> You know, that's not it's not necessarily a threat thing. It's a drive thing. It's our motivation for, for doing things. It's our incentive. And then we have the soothing system, which is supposed to be soothing and supposed to um, give us space to connect with people and um, and feel better in a, in a way. So the, the way I'd apply it to this situation, um, which, again, we kind of talked a little bit about. It's, you know, it's not an approach um, the client had heard of before. So I didn't we, we didn't go too much into it. Um, but the idea was uh, we spoke about a situation where a previous friend of hers had tried to go through some of the stuff and help her sort it out. And actually what had happened is she just thrown a lot of it away. And that made I mean, she doesn't speak to her friend anymore because of that situation. And we talked a little bit about why she thinks that might have been. And her immediate response was, I just felt so threatened. And that kind of made alarm bells go off in my head and go, right, let's talk about compassion focused therapy. Um, because her threat system is so activated when her hoard, anyone thinks about touching her hoard or doing anything with it. It's such a massive sense of threat 
because the way that she soothes is to, to keep stuff and collect stuff. Um, and as well, um, compassion focused therapy, you can consider the historical influences as well. So um, for this client, her threat system was regularly activated as a child, um, causing her to have a massively long history with anxiety. Um, uh, so I think that definitely means that her threat system is quite easily activated and she understood that it kind of made sense um to her so that those are a couple of different theories and models that you can that you can think about um it, when you're doing these doing these reflections um yeah i hope that i hope that helps hopefully that that makes sense um fab okay uh going back through then let's go back through um Yes, uh, fab, right. So if you want to get involved, absolutely, please do come and follow us on all the social media. Um, you can join the UK Declan Site Applicants Reflective Space Facebook group, which I will link below if you're watching the recording. Um, and uh, all the units from all the other webinars with all the materials will be available there. So all of the templates, you know, any references that I'm discussing and the recording of the video and things like that will all be on, on those units that you can access for free. Subscribe on YouTube, obviously, you can do that too. Um, and you can follow us on Insta. So we are really close to getting a thousand followers on Instagram. And if you do, we're going to do a giveaway if we can get to a thousand. And what I'm going to give away is this fantastic book. Hopefully you can see that. I sincerely hope you can. It's a surviving clinical psychology book and it's been edited by James Randall with lots of different authors in there. So I really hope... I really hope you can see that. It is honestly a fantastic book for any aspiring psychologist at whatever stage you're at in your in your career. Um, so if you follow us on Instagram and subscribe on YouTube, and you can um, just sort of show me evidence of that, I suppose, um, if you win. If you follow us on Insta and subscribe on YouTube, you might be able to win this book because I'll be doing like a prize draw as soon as I get to a thousand followers on Insta. So make sure you follow us if you want to win a book. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for joining us this evening um, on this really cold and I'm in Wales and it's very, very wet here. Um, fortunately, not affected by flooding, but 